not going to uh, continue today with our Harvest Vision series. We're going to take a break. Hallelujah. Amen. Instead, we're going to focus our attention on a woman Jesus said was a woman of great faith. Now, interestingly, in many ways, she was the wrong kind of woman from the wrong kind of place with the wrong kind of background. The scripture tells us that religiously, she was a pagan. Culturally, she was a Greek. And ethnically, she was a Canaanite. In other words, she was not a Jew. She did, however, believe in Jesus, who was a Jew. At least, she believed that Jesus could, and if he wanted to, would heal her daughter and deliver her daughter from the bondage of the devil. Amen. And so he did. And so he still does. Jesus is still healing the sick. Amen? Amen. Jesus still heals the brokenhearted. Amen? Amen? Jesus still sets the captives free. And so in this message, which I've entitled, The Children's Bread, we're going to examine three kingdom principles illustrated in the encounter between Jesus and this Syrophoenician woman. But we're not going to use the account recorded in St. Mark's Gospel, which we just read. Rather, we're going to use St. Matthew's version of the encounter because he includes an important element that Mark does not. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. Kingdom principle number one illustrated in this encounter, again, between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Principle number one, not everyone is supposed to minister to everybody every time. Let me say it again, it's a little long. Not everyone is supposed to minister to everybody every time. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, listen to the word of the Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and cried, Behold, Jesus have mercy on me. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her a word. Now this is the part that Matthew, uh, Mark skips, Matthew includes, but it's a very important part. Notice that in response to this cry of this mother, for Jesus to heal and deliver her daughter, how Jesus responded. Not one single word. In other words, he meets her appeal with complete silence. Now, isn't that interesting? It might be misunderstood that this silence was a sign of Jesus' indifference, as if he didn't care about her or her daughter, as if Jesus was a cold person, a callous person, maybe even a cruel person. But how many of you know that's not Jesus at all? Amen. In fact, the scripture is very clear that Jesus was anything but cold, callous, and cruel. Yea, he had a heart of the Father, and he revealed the Father's heart of care, compassion, and concern. So here's what we have to understand at the beginning of this encounter. Even when we are faced with silence on God's part, or even when we're faced with what seems like silence on God's part in our cries to heaven, that silence doesn't mean that he doesn't care about his people. Amen. Sometimes it's just silence, but silence doesn't imply 
a lack of compassion. Jesus is the good shepherd. Amen. He laid down his life for his sheep. So even when our cries are met with silence, God still has a plan and a purpose for our life. Are you with me? Amen. And if we'll but press into God, sooner or later, he'll tell us what that plan and purpose is, even for the silence. And so we continue. Matthew 15, 23, his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away. So now not only is she met with silence, now she's met with rejection, for she's crying after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we know the reason for the silence. It wasn't that Jesus isn't concerned about her. But he knows his mission and his ministry is for the Jews and not the Gentiles. Amen? In other words, the Father sent him to do a job, to do it a certain way, and to do it to a certain people. And this woman, regardless of her circumstances, her situation, or her heart's desire, fell out of the boundaries of his mission and his ministry. Hello? And therefore, regardless of how he might have felt, no matter how he, what he might have wanted to do, no matter that he might have desired to do something for her, he wasn't going to do it until he knew the Father released him to do so. Hello. Amen. Are you beginning to get a picture? Yeah. This is a principle we all need to learn to live by. Our mission, our ministry, our life is supposed to be spirit-driven, not people-driven. Come on. Amen. Including us. In other words, we're supposed to listen to what God wants us to do, not what other people want us to do, or even what we want to do. Amen. Now you know the reason for Jesus' is silence. He wasn't going to do anything until the Father released him to do so. So here's the deal. Are you ready for the deal? Mm -hmm. People are always wanting us to do something. Yeah. People are always wanting us to give something. Do you get all that mail? Mm -hmm. People always want us to say something. And if we let our life be people driven, We'll never be spirit-driven. In the end, what we need to strive to do is do what God wants us to do. To give what God wants us to give and to speak what God wants us to say. And until we know what it is, we should just keep quiet. Boy, that's tough. You see, not everyone is supposed to do everything for everybody every time. You want me to say that again? Not everyone is supposed to do everything for everybody every time. And that doesn't it matter, it doesn't matter who it is or what they want or even how we feel about it. In fact, sometimes our feelings get in the way of God's will. There are times when God just wants us to be still, to be quiet and let him of work. In fact, let me tell you, sometimes our good intentions get in God's way. We have a tendency to want to fix things in other people's lives. Have you ever noticed that? Mothers are particularly guilty. Right? Come on, mothers. Because when your children are little, you fix things. But how many of you know when they get big, sometimes you're not supposed to fix things? Sometimes you're just supposed to let God deal with them. And if we keep getting in the way, God can't deal with them because what are we doing? We're trying to fix things. Another problem that we have is we all have opinions about everything. Did you notice that? And we have a saying in this country, everybody's entitled to his opinion. Well, tell that to God. Because as far as God's concerned, sometimes we're not entitled to anything at all. 
but we always want to give everybody our, come on, opinion, because we think it's so important. But sometimes we're not supposed to give our opinion, we're just supposed to keep our mouth, because our opinion doesn't matter. Sometimes we just need to let God be God and get out of his way. Now, here's the thing about us also. Well, did you notice that we love to talk? In fact, we love to talk so much, even if nobody's around, we'll talk to ourselves. Right? Now, here's what I believe. I believe it's okay if we talk to ourselves. That doesn't mean we're crazy. However, if when we talk to ourselves, we don't listen, we got a problem. <laughs> but what's the point? Let's remember Jesus. It didn't matter how he felt. It didn't matter whether he wanted to fix this woman's problem. It didn't matter that his heart was full of compassion. He's going to stay silent and pray until he knows what the Father wants him to do, if the Father wants him to do anything at all. And then when he's heard from the Lord, hello, then he does what the Lord's told him and released him to do. That's what we ought to be doing as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in every situation, there's the right person, there's the right time, and then there's the right way. Sometimes we're the right person, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we have the right way, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have the right word, sometimes we don't. So we just need to know when to speak and when to hold our peace. Amen? Amen. Principle number two. Persistence pays off. Back to Matthew 15, this time verse 25. But she came and knelt before Jesus saying, Lord, help me. Clearly, this woman wasn't taking silence for an answer. In spite of the fact that Jesus initially has refused to speak to her, the disciples have encouraged her him to send her away. She presses in and presses on because she has a desperate need. And here's what we learn from her. Persistence is a kingdom principle and we should press in until God responds. How long do we press in? How long do we press on? We keep pressing and pressing on until our prayers are answered. No matter how long it takes, no matter how hopeless it seems, no matter how desperate we become, no matter what other people say, no matter even if we aren't even hearing from God yet, we keep throwing ourselves at the feet of Jesus until Jesus speaks a word into our life and until he starts working in our life. Amen? That's what this woman should teach us about God's kingdom. Now we understand that sometimes there's a delay. That's what she's experiencing. She's experiencing the delay between her asking and Jesus' answering. But she's not going to let that delay dissuade her from an answer to her prayer. I can tell you, many times in our lives, especially when we're praying for something powerful and miraculous, there's often a delay. There's a delay between the sowing and the reaping, between the praying and the answer, between the knocking and the opening. There's a delay. And the problem is, the challenge is, what are we going to do during the delay? Do we keep on keeping on, trusting that God's working, even in the silence? Or do we give up and quit before he answers our prayer? The problem that we have as human beings is we don't know what's happening in the season of silence. That's the problem with silence. Have you ever tried to sit in a room by yourself quietly for 30 minutes and not say a word? Mm -hmm. Listen to the phone or the television set. 
ever tried that? Yeah. You know how hard it is? Yes. It's really hard. hard. We are so used to things coming at us all the time yeah. that 30 seconds of silence feels like an eternity sometimes. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been on a, well, I was going to say been on a date, but we haven't been on a date in years. <laughs> But have you been in a situation where you're with a group of people and everybody suddenly gets quiet? You ever been in a situation like that? The conversation just stops. What do you feel like doing? Filling the void. But have you ever been in a situation where you're comfortable with another person and then you can sit on the beach together, that's for your benefit, Thank you. and be quiet? And you don't feel like you've got to fill anything. Amen. If we're comfortable with God, we don't have to keep talking all the time. Sometimes we just let God be God. Amen. Because God might be doing something during that quiet time. Amen. Maybe during the silent season, he's waiting for a better time to answer our prayer, though we want our prayer answered right now. But right now is not the right time. And he knows it's not the right time, so he's just waiting and making us wait for the, come on, the right time. Maybe during that silent season, he's trying to do something in us or in someone else's life. And so he's got to wait to answer our prayer until the work is accomplished. Or maybe during the silent season, he's just trying to see how serious we are about our prayers. Are we willing to press in and last more than five minutes? How about five days? How about five weeks? How about five months? How about five years? How about five decades? I've known mothers who prayed for their children for decades and their children finally came to faith. What if the mother had given out at the 49th year? God has his way. The test of our faith, bless you, Thank you, is not when God's answering our prayers right on our time. The test of our faith comes when the prayers are met with silence. And we have to trust God even when he's not speaking. So back to Matthew 15, verse 26. Here's what Jesus answered this time. It is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How about that for an encouraging word? She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered her, a woman, Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Back to the persistence. What if she had given up too soon? Think of it. She's met with silence. She doesn't give up. She's met with rejection. She doesn't give up. Then she's met with Jesus' response that I can't give you the bread because you're not one of the children. She doesn't give up. But what if she had? I would assume, given the scriptures, that her daughter would have not been healed. There would have been no deliverance. She would have seen no miracle. So, following her example, here's the principle. Never give up, never give in, and never give up. We just keep on praying and we keep on waiting until God breaks the silence and breaks into our life with the miracle for which we've been seeking. Amen? Amen. Now that's not to say, as we well know, that just because we're asking something, God's required to give it. In other words, God may not answer our prayer in exactly the way we're praying. But what we're looking is for the silence to be broken and God to speak a word. How many of you know that no is an answer? Amen. 
Amen. Amen? Amen. No is an answer, but at least it's an answer. Remember St. Paul? Maybe not personally, don't remember St. Paul. St. Paul is known as the apostle of faith, a man of tremendous faith. But we know that there was at least one situation wherein this man of great faith prayed to the Father three specific times to be delivered from what he called a thorn in the flesh. By the way, I don't believe it was his mother-in-law, even though that's the word. Yet in spite of this great man of faith, praying by faith at least three times, the same number of times, by the way, this Syrophoenician woman is crying out to Jesus in the scriptures, God said no. I'm not going to remove the thorn in your flesh. But my grace is sufficient for you. That's an answer. And when St. Paul got the answer, I assumed he stopped the prayer. Because now he knew the word and the will of the Lord for his life. But that's the word for us too, isn't it? Isn't God's grace always sufficient for us? We may not get exactly the answer we want. We may be waiting for the answer to come, but whether we're in the season of silence or we're in the season of, 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 of hearing, it doesn't matter. God's grace is sufficient for our needs. Amen? Amen? So we just keep on keeping on trusting God with our life, believing and knowing that this is the children's prayer. So that's principle number three. Healing is the children's bread. Back to Matthew 15, just time, verse 26. Just that little phrase. It is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, at first, that might sound a little, well, okay, harsh is a good word. As if here he's calling this woman a dog. But he didn't call her a dog at all. He's simply using an illustration. And the illustration is very straightforward. Say you're at dinner in your home. And the children are sitting at your table. And your pet dog is lying at your feet. To whom do you give the food first? Well, I hope your answer is, I give it to my children. Because the children's bread is your provision for your family. You would never think of taking the food off of their plate and putting it in the dog bowl. I hope you wouldn't. That's what Jesus is saying. This healing bread belongs to the children of God. It's not right to take it out of their mouths and give it to the family pet. Now I know that we live in a different generation. Sometimes people in our generation, I hope we don't step on anybody's toes, consider pets people. I'm sorry. Animals are animals and people are people. So a pet's a wonderful thing, but it's not the same as your child Amen. or your grandchild Amen. or your husband <laughs> or anything else in your household. It's just a pet. So Jesus is right. What father would take his children's bread and give it to the pet? Well, not our Heavenly Father and not any good earthly father. The father provides for his children first. And here's the good news. We're his children. Amen. So in this strange little saying is a promise that we, sitting at the father's table, that bread belongs to us. Amen. And what is the father's provision? Healing, deliverance, forgiveness, salvation, prosperity, all the inheritance of Abraham belong to God's children, and he's not going to take it away from us and give it to somebody else. 
However, at this woman's insistence, Jesus acknowledged that the children's bread can be shared with others than the children. And that's why it's perfectly legitimate for us to pray for unbelievers. How many of you pray for people that don't believe? Amen. Anybody? Amen. It's why we continue to minister to unbelievers. Because even though they're not yet at the Father's table, they can share in some measure in the Father's provision. And that's what the woman appealed to Jesus. No, I don't belong at the table. But even the family pet can eat what falls off of the family table. And she was willing to be satisfied for even the crumbs. That's how great a faith she had. Mm -hmm. But back to us. The bread belongs to us. It's our portion. It's our inheritance. It's our blessing. And that's why, as we prayed earlier today, that's why we come before the throne of grace boldly and confidently, not begging, but crying out in confidence and trust that our Father who art in heaven has provided food for his children on his table. Ephesians 1, 3 puts it this way. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. How many is every spiritual blessing? Is it every, every? Every means nothing's not on the table. It means our healing is on the table. Hallelujah. Amen. Our deliverance is on the table. Amen. Our prosperity is on the table. Our peace is on the table. Amen. Our protection is on the table. Our salvation is on the table. Our forgiveness is on the table. God's favor is on the table. It's all on the table. Amen. All we have to do is by faith partake of the children's bread, the Father's provision in ever-increasing measure. Now, I am a grandfather now, been a father. I know how children like to eat as long as the food is to their liking. You sit them down at the table, and if the food's to their liking, here's what you don't have to do. Beg them to eat. You have to tell them to wait until we say the grace and everybody's seated. Otherwise, they'll wolf down all your food before you get any. We're sitting at the Father's table. The Father shouldn't have to beg us to eat. Amen. Amen. Our heart's desire is for that which is on the table. And like his children, we're clamoring. God to give us of his salvation in ever increasing measure. And here's, here's where I want to draw to a close. This bread that's on the table is all symbolized and manifested on that altar. It's the body and the blood of Christ who is the bread, hello, which came down from heaven, of which a man may eat and live forever. That's the children's bread. We partake of that provision every week by faith. No, we're not worthy in ourselves, but he's made us worthy to receive his body and his blood. So as we do so, may the intention in our heart be each and every time that whatever portion of the children's bread we need at that hour, that's what we receive by faith and with great thanksgiving. That we're pressing in like this woman did, knowing that the silence of today may well become the miracle of tomorrow. That it is his time and his way, our prayers and our pleas will be answered, and we shall receive the children's prayer. Woman, great is your faith. 
we have done for you according to your desire. May it be done to us according to tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Amen.